Well, thanks. Um, it's great to see everybody here. This sounds loud to me. So I've, full disclosure, I'm not a demographer, um, but I'm a historian of, of types, and I guess that must have been what, what, what Jim had seen when he approached me about a year and a half ago and asked or inquired a little bit about, about the prospects of maybe um, thinking about, about an eventual move for, for Jim and his group to Denmark. And um, those plans, of course, have developed quite a bit since then. And what I would like to do is to maybe try to explain a little bit about what Jim might have seen in me to begin with, and then to explain a little bit about what this group and the Institute of Biology will be up to in the, next, in the next several years. So a little bit about myself. As I said, I'm a bit of a historian, but a historian of a different type. I'm um, very interested, in fact, some would say consumed with trying to understand the, the interplay between the history of life on Earth and the evolution of, of, of the chemistry of, of the environment. And I'll just give you a little bit of a brief introduction into that. If I can figure out how to... So I've tried all the buttons, and I seem to have turned it off. There we go. So I've spent a great deal of my adult life trying to generate this graph here, which is a history of atmospheric oxygen through geologic time. It may or may not be, be correct, but I think, think it would be fair to call it the current understanding. Oxygen is very, very low in early Earth history. Um, oxygen has increased. and a very interesting period of time is here around 500 to 600 million years ago when animals first started to evolve. Our best ideas is that oxygen levels increased at this period in Earth history. In fact, there's an idea that oxygen itself, an increase in oxygen, might have enabled the evolution of animals because animals, as we understand them, have a, have a reasonably high requirement for oxygen. So in order to try to pursue ideas like that, we go into the field and we, we, we look at various creatures. This is an interesting creature from about 570 million years ago. It's a very, very early evolved animal called a Charnia discus. And actually, there aren't any representatives of this type of animal anymore on the Earth's surface. Here's another one of its cousins called a so-called spindle form, another kind of an early evolved animal in the history of animal life. And here's another beautifully well-represented relation to that. So what we would ideally like to do is to understand the kind of chemical environment, particularly the kind of oxygen levels, that an animal like this might have required in order to have survived at that time in Earth history. Of course, these things have been dead for about 550 million years, so that experiment is not that easy to conduct. But this experiment is. Sponges are likely relatives to those Ediacarans that I've talked about you, and they're the most primitive of the existing types of animals that we have present on, on the Earth's surface today. So we've been engaged in trying to understand how these organisms actually have, what their requirements for oxygen indeed are. And this maybe is what, 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 what attracted Jim, because ultimately this becomes a very interesting demographic question. We, we start with an organism that we impose conditions, which it's not used to, but we want to understand its survival under these conditions. So we indeed have to switch our eyes a little bit, change our glasses, and start to look at this from a, from a, from a demographic perspective. If we really want to understand how this type of an organism might have conducted itself under a Earth surface chemistry, which is very, very different than what we have today. So the history of life on Earth is not just a history of evolution, it's also a history of catastrophic death. And some of these so-called mass extinctions are listed, whoops, are listed here on this graph where we see the frequency of extinction intensity, and you see some times in Earth history when the frequency of extinction intensity was very, very large, and the end Permian mass extinction was the largest of them all when ultimately about 90 to 95 percent of all the animal species on the planet of the Earth went extinct. Now the causes for that extinction aren't, aren't desperately well understood, but 
Jim is fond of saying that mass extinctions are a demographic event, and I think that's a very, very good way of viewing mass extinctions. There's some kind of a perturbation in the environment, whether it's a, a catastrophic input of carbon dioxide or an overturning of deep ocean water. The survival of an individual species that is being impacted by this event depends upon a number of, of issues, and those issues are, does this kill mechanism actually impact the adult? How does it impact the young organism? And how does it impact an organism through its whole lifestyle? It could be that an adult organism actually can tolerate whatever this, that this perturbation is, but the kill mechanism actually comes by, by a stronger influence through the organism in its larval stage. And these are the kinds of details of extinction which, 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 which um, many people within the Maxo group and the Biology Institute are going to try to understand. So the demographics, the biodemographics of mass extinction is going to be a major theme during, during, part, of the, during, during part of the work in the Maxo in biology. And we're going through one of the largest mass extinctions of all in Earth history right now, and that's an anthropogenic imposed mass extinction, which is, which is related to, 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 to a variety of things. For example, oops, our canning of sea turtles might be, might be one example. The netting of sea turtles is another example. Well, the idea here is that, is that if we want to try to do something about this terrible interruption and, 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 and disintegration, of, of modern species on the planet Earth, maybe we can use a demographic approach to try to do that. And with sea turtles, an example, the, the group in Maxo in biology is interested, well, if we want to try to, to, try to save, save sea turtle species, especially those which are on the brink of extinction, where do we concentrate our efforts? Do we concentrate our efforts on the young organisms? Do we concentrate our efforts on the elderly organisms? And ultimately, to understand how to answer that question, we have to look at the demographics of the lifestyles and the livelihoods of these different organisms. And through that kind of research, then we can hopefully make better predictions and produce better models and give better advice as to how some of these endangered species can best be, can best be saved. If we go a little bit further, we heard a little bit about this in the, uh, in the beginning of, of, the, um, of the session this morning from, from, from Mineta. And, and the idea is that, is that we're very, very used to organisms aging, right? That's just sort of a standard that we, that we tend to understand, but, but it doesn't appear that all organisms, in fact, do age. And, and Hydra, whoops, seems to be an example of an organism that, that doesn't. And by that, I mean that the probability of death doesn't seem to increase as the organism, as the organism gets older. So one might be able to ask the question, oh, Hydra is also another one of these, these primitive types of, of organisms which are alive on the Earth today. So one might be able to ask the question, when actually did aging, senescence, appear in the evolution of animal life on Earth? And we can even ask that question more broadly and say, well, here's a tree of life, of all life on Earth, and maybe we can understand the dynamics of aging, the dynamics of, 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 of senescence, the, the dynamics of, of, of demography through as much of this tree of life as, as we can. And by doing this, we can possibly understand not only the, um, the, the origins of the evolution of aging, but, well, actually, that is probably what we would understand best, is, is the origin of the evolution of aging, which I think is very, very fascinating. And this type of research is going to be also conducted in the Institute of Biology with special um, cooperation with, uh, with the Institute in Rostock as well. So with that, I would like to, um, to, 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 to thank Jim for making this initiative and bringing it to us. And I'm especially also looking forward to cooperation with CORE and the group in public health. And I'd like to, to welcome the new and dynamic, interesting group of, 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 of I, my view them as young investigators coming into the Biology Institute. And I really, really think that we're looking towards uh, some very, very exciting times in the future. I'm extremely excited about, about this initiative. And um, yeah, I guess that's what I wanted to say. Thanks. <laughs>